John chapter 4 then, verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sakar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for its life-giving power. May it have its intended effects on each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you might remember from last time in John chapter 4, we have the down and out, the woman of Samaria, in contrast with the up and out of John chapter 3, who was Nicodemus. But both were outside the kingdom. Nicodemus being the elite theologian, the teacher of Israel, in terms of higher echelon in society, there was not anything greater. And yet, in contrast, here was not only someone of an ethnic group that was despised by the Jews, but she was despised even among her own country people because of her lifestyle. We see this in so many ways, but mainly because she came alone, unlike the others who would come in groups to talk and chat as women around the well as they drew water each day. They would come early in the morning, or else late at night, missing the central heat of the day. But she came at noon, and she came alone. And the obvious influence there, and I think it's a legitimate one, is she came alone because she would not be talked to, she would not be in uh, cahoots with anyone else. She came alone because she was one who was despised even of her own ethnic clan. In verse 15, we pick up the story as Jesus is outlining the need for what he had to give her rather than simply the natural water that she was able to draw from the well. 
Verse 15. The woman said to, her, to him, Sir, give me this water, this living water that he'd reference, so I'll not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And she was thinking in very much natural terms, just as Nicodemus was in chapter 3 when Jesus was talking about new birth. Do I have to enter a second time into my mother's womb to be born? As was his physical understanding. So this lady understood the need for water and she was very interested in water that would be in continual supply that she would not have, not have need to come in the heat of the day. Now we've already read in the early part of this that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And we understand from the geography that that was not the case in the physical realm because he could have gone west or east and avoided Samaria if he wanted to go north. But he was on an assignment. He had to go there because it was the Father's schedule for him to go there. And he came there and was alone because he'd sent his disciples out to get the rations for the day, the food for the day, or for the next couple of days. How many people does it take to get food? I don't know, but he sent them all to go and get the food. And that was because he wanted to have this amazing encounter with the woman. This woman who is unnamed here in the story. In verse 16, he said to her, well, let's talk about it. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've correctly said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you've said truly. Jesus, knowing all things, had supernatural insight and understood she was correct in saying, I have no husband, rather than saying, well, I'll just go get him and lying about the situation. He appreciated, I'm sure, the fact that she was honest. I don't have a husband. And Jesus was able to tell her her life story. You've had five. And in fact, the one whom you now have is not your husband. You've spoken truly. Now, this has to do with today in our own terms, what we would call the idea of living together. It's very popular. Other people might say even knowing that it's not the right thing to be living together while not being married. And they say sometimes this, we're married in the eyes of the Lord. You ever heard that? We're, we're, God knows we're married. We just haven't got the paperwork yet. Uh, he sees us as married. We're okay with Him. I would just say, allow Jesus to be Jesus. Don't speak for Him. And when He speaks, listen to Him. Because according to Jesus, He did not accept that idea. Let's believe in the true Jesus, not in one of our own making. The Jesus of the Bible says... No, the one you have now is not your husband. I don't know how he could have been more clear. Living together is not legitimate marriage. Well, it's only the paperwork. Well, get the paperwork. And the idea is this, that God has granted marriage and the paperwork necessary for it to be legitimate in the eyes of God. The one whom you now have is not your husband. I could spend a lot of time meddling there, but we're going to go to verse 19. <laughs> the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. I've always read that and laughed out loud as I've read it. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. He just not only opened her mail, he read her mail and showed uh, exactly what the mail meant. And immediately in perceiving that this was supernatural revelation of uh, a sort she'd not encountered before, no one uh, outside that particular area knew of her life story, but Jesus did, and she immediately went to a theological question. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people, that's the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now for many years I read this and thought she was in the uh, arena here of deflection. Let, let's get the attention off me, my sin, uh, and let's talk some theology. Uh, you know, now we've got a discussion going. Uh, I, I want to get off the husband stuff. Let, let's talk theology. I thought that's what's going on. But before we're so quick to do that, in understanding more of the, uh, the real background of the passage... 
rather than assuming that the lady's attempting to dodge and deflect because of being convicted of a sin, just remember who it is we're talking about here. This is a woman who's utterly despised even by her own ethnic people and in her entire lifetime, how many theological conversations would she have had with a Jew? I don't know, we'd be guessing. Maybe that round figure of zero would apply. I don't know. Could have been two, could have been three. But I don't think it would have been many. And more than that, here was opportunity to speak to a Jew who was obviously in with God. He had special insight. He had revelation. He was a prophet and she knew it. She did not yet know all that he was. And that would be unveiled as the conversation progressed and she'd come to understand who Jesus was in a way that was breathtaking. But at this point, she at least understand with just a few sentences out of the lips of Jesus, this man is different, he's a prophet, I want to ask him something. And she did. Who's right? The Samaritans or the Jews regarding the place of worship? Now, if she knew what a prophet was, and I believe she did, she would understand that everything that would come out of his mouth would be true and from God. And so she was asking a legitimate question because this was the question of all questions. Who's right? The Samaritan says, you've got to go to this place to worship. The Jews say, no, you've got to go to this place. Who's right? Now remember, the Samaritans only acknowledge the five first books of the Bible, the books of Moses, that's Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. One of the main reasons for that is the things that they were doing that God did not like were outlined in later books. And so they much preferred the first five books of Moses. And if you ask this question, where was the meeting place for the people of God in those books? And the answer would be the tabernacle. As the book of Exodus unfolds, and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's the tabernacle that sent a stage, which was, as you remember, a mobile tent. It had no fixed, permanent residence. In fact, when the cloud moved, the tabernacle moved. When there was fire by night and the fire started moving, the tabernacle had to move. It was a place of mobility rather than stability in one place. That revelation of the temple would come later, much later in Israel's history. And so she was looking backwards. And now having access to someone who was telling the truth and she understood that, she was wanting answers. So I'm not quick to say she was just trying to dodge. I think that could have been the case, but more likely, this was her great opportunity to get the biggest question of her life sorted out. And who better to talk to than Jesus? And who better to talk to than what she knew of as a prophet? She was looking backwards. Who got it right? Now, Jesus would answer her fully, and he did not compromise on his answer in any way, and he made it clear The Jews got it right. I don't know what she felt. We don't have that written out for us in the text. But you guys are wrong. The Jews are right. That was the message. And it would be more than that. Jesus would be saying not only did they get things wrong, but they got most of their things wrong. You look at the text and it's very clear. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, she asked, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. What did Jesus say? Uh, Very politically incorrect words. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Wow. That's verse 22. The Samaritans worship without knowledge. According to Jesus, having rejected God's further revelation of those books outside of the first five without reason to do so. And so he was saying, you Samaritans worship in ignorance. So she was looking backwards, but he didn't leave her there. He says, you got it wrong. You Samaritans, you got it wrong. The Jews got it right. Because the written revelation of Jehovah, of Yahweh has said where the place of worship is to be. And it's true. 
The Jews got it right. But he didn't leave her there. He pointed her forward. Look in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain, which was the Samarian mountain, Samaritan mountain, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Now, Jesus accused the woman and by extension the Samaritans of ignorant worship. This is a theme that you find advanced throughout the scriptures and earlier in our service Romans 10 was read. Let me just remind you of what it says. Paul is speaking of his heart desire for the people of Israel to be saved. And he said this, he wrote this, Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them, that's the Jewish people, is for their salvation. They're not in the kingdom of God by means of their natural birth. They need to be born again. He's already made that clear with Nicodemus. And Jesus has made that clear. Now Paul is saying the same thing. They need to be saved. They're in need of salvation. Why? Look at verse 2 if you were to go there. Romans 10, 2. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Isn't that interesting? The Samaritans had zeal without knowledge. Now the Jews have zeal without knowledge. Not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing, notice those words, not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves, come under the righteousness of God. You see, zeal, but no knowledge is not enough. Religious zeal is not a rare thing. You know that. It's found everywhere. I remember being in gospel outreach meetings in the southern part of India and just a few hundred yards away was a Hindu festival and uh, I was told that just a few weeks before when there was a similar sort of outreach taking place that the Hindus there had thrown live snakes into the Christian assembly thinking that they were doing the gods a favor by getting rid of the Christians who would bite, be bitten by these snakes. And that made me go to my closet and pray a little more when I understood we were having a meeting in a few hours and the Hindus were still doing their thing next door. But people have zeal everywhere. You can go to South America and see zeal. You can go across town and see zeal. You can go to China and see zeal. Zeal without knowledge is not enough. People say, as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe. Uh, Try that according to this passage. Try that according to Jesus. Just be sincere. Well, you can be sincerely wrong, and when it's within your scope to uh, understand what God has revealed and you have access to it, you and I are in deep weeds. Because our issue, if we've never even heard of Jesus, is we know there's a God and we've worshipped someone other than Him. Romans 1 makes it clear that we know that there is a God. Moving right along. People say, well, you know, as long as people are sincere. No, ignorance is not bliss, especially when that ignorance is willful. So I want to ask you, do you want to know? Do you want to know who the true God is? Some people don't want to know. They want to stay with the zeal they have, the uh, ardent passion they have, despite the fact that God said something other than what they are doing is the way to approach Him. I hope that's not true of you. I hope there's a desire and a strong desire for truth. There's something in you that says, I want to know the truth, even if it costs me. The book of Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. Whatever it takes, I must know the truth. Is truth important to you? If it is, how important? For the Christian and for anybody. The answer should rise from our hearts. Nothing is more important than the true knowledge of God. When God is working on an individual's soul, bringing them to the truth, He first of all gives them a desire to know that truth. And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, your soul depends on it. Jesus said words like this later in John's Gospel. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You've got to believe certain things. You've got to believe the right thing about the Lord Jesus. 
R.C. Sproul said this, God is never pleased with ignorant worship, with worship that is not grounded in the knowledge of God. Where was the knowledge to come from? Well, the next uh, phrase in our text tells us, Jesus speaking, for salvation is from the Jews. You might look at that and say, does, does my Bible actually say salvation is from the Jews? Uh, yeah, it says salvation is from the Jews. And if ever there was a loaded statement in the Bible, that's it. Do you realize the Bible is basically a Jewish book? The prophets of the old, the apostles of the new, basically all Jewish, one or two exceptions, very, very rare. <sighs> Do you know a Jew saved me? And if anyone's to get into the kingdom, they've got to come through a Jew? Uh, well, I, I don't like Jews. Well, you've got a problem with uh, God because when God became a man, He became a Jew. <laughs> and Jesus is actually the Jewish Messiah. When we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus the Messiah. Which Messiah? Canadian Messiah? Uh, Chinese Messiah? Uh, Jewish Messiah of the line of David. The line of the tribe of Judah. Oh, I... I, I uh, oh... Yeah, you got a problem. Jesus didn't call the apostle Simon or John. That's an anglicized version of their names. They were called by their Hebrew or Arama Aramaic names. Simon was called Shimon. Do you remember the uh, Israeli uh, prime minister, Shimon Peres? That's where we see that name in modern day. Shimon ben Yonah. That is Simon, son of Jonah. Remember that little phrase? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Shimon ben Yonah. James was Yaakov. That is Jacob. John was Yohanan. Bartholomew was bar -talme, son of Ptolemy. Matthew was Matityahu, meaning gift of God. Thomas was Tauma. Thaddeus was a variant of Thudas, which was a Grecian virgin of Judas or Yehuda. Oh, are you messing with my Bible? No, I'm not messing with your Bible. Andrew and Philip, interesting because they're clearly Greek names. They're no Hebrew equivalents. Uh, but uh, we uh, really surmise that they were Grecian Jews and that's because when Jesus called his apostles, they were Jewish apostles. So they might have had an anglicized, or in this case, a, a Gentile sounding name, but they were definitely Jews. Judas Iscariot was Yehuda. Judas is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Judah. And this was not just an Old Testament idea or the time of the New Testament idea. Do you know the heavenly Jerusalem is going to have... Jewish graffiti on the walls? <laughs> Let me say it the way it's going to be. Yerushalayim. The heavenly Yerushalayim. I've never heard of the Yerushalayim. Have you ever been to the Yerushalayim? It's the city of God where you and I are headed as Christians, where we're going to be in the presence of God forever. The heavenly Yerushalayim. <laughs> Wow. The names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel are written on the gates. Oh, I'm not sure I want to go. Well, you're going to go. Uh, you got a problem. You got a, prob you got a problem with Jews? Jesus saves you and he's a Jew. I'm saved by a Jewish carpenter. How about you? Praise the Lord. Moving right along. This is strong stuff. And we haven't got to verse 23 yet. So let's get to verse 23. But an hour is coming, and now is, now he's pointing her forward. He's sorting out the issue of what happened in history. The Jews were right, you Samaritans were wrong. Okay? You got that? Okay. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. We'll come back to that. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshippers. We're going to see that phrase again in the next verse. In spirit and truth. When you see something once, that's uh, enough. But when you see it twice, the Lord is emphasizing something. And he's saying this. 
you're worried about location. You know the three laws of real estate. Location, location, location. And you're all worried about which place is the place. I've answered your question, but an hour's coming where location won't matter. People will be able to worship me anywhere in this world. Phoenix, Arizona. Let's think of the furthest place from where we're having this conversation. And it doesn't get much further than there. There'll be people worshipping me rightly, legitimately, because it's not going to be based on location. Anywhere, the Father will be worshipped. As long as the worship is in spirit and truth. There he's talking about the nature of worship. And it's going to be a spiritual kind of worship. The Old Testament gives us incident after incident where the people of God were going through ritual, but the Lord was grieved by the worship. Do you remember this phrase? Oftentimes you'll hear it. These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God was not impressed with the religious formalism of that day or our day. He wants true worship, which according to Him is in spirit and truth. Many people, even in our own day, have the mistaken idea you've got to go somewhere to meet God. You've got to go on a pilgrimage to this place or that place, depending on the religion. You've got to see St. Thomas's bones. You've got to see uh, St. Peter's skull. You've got to go to Mecca. You've got to go this place. You've got to go that place. And Jesus says, an hour is coming and now is... When true worship is going to be in spirit and truth, that's the nature of the worship the Father is seeking. Worship will be according to a spiritual desire from the heart rather than simply from a location. Let's talk about this business of seeking. Many people don't understand this and because there are commands in Scripture to say, seek the Lord, some people have the idea that man can do that apart from grace. And the idea is this, if God says, do this, I must have the power to do that or else God wouldn't be legitimate in his command to ask me to do that. Well, that doesn't hold true if you apply many of the things we see in scripture. God often tells us to do things that are impossible to do without him. And that's the point. Like this one, be perfect even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Oh yeah, yeah, I I, I, I did that last Tuesday. No, 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 you didn't. (laughs) Well, nobody's perfect. Yeah, and that's the point. The standard is perfection, and it's not good just because 100% of us are not perfect. That's why we need grace. God's standard isn't lowered because He wants people to pass. He wants them to acknowledge their failure so they look to Him for salvation. He doesn't drop the standard and say, I know I said perfect, but what I mean is slightly better than Hitler and a lot better than Stalin. No, the perfection required is the holiness of God and He's not dropping that standard a single centimeter. That's the standard. And we fall short of it, are in need of grace. And so the Bible says in places like Isaiah 55, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. And we think, well, I can do that. Well, go to Romans 3.11 and you'll read this. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Literally it says there is no God seeker. What do we do with that? Well, we accept Isaiah and we accept Romans as both being inspired documents. And God commands us to seek the Lord. But outside of God giving us a gift, man does not seek the Lord. There is no God seeker. By nature, we're rebels hiding from the one true God. We're in the nature of Adam after the fall. What happened in Adam affects all of us. Read Romans 5. And after the fall, he didn't run to God and say, I'm sorry God, I need you. No, he's hiding from God. Covering himself with his own religious works, we could say. By nature, we're rebels hiding. 
while the fo- now hear this the form of hiding might be varied some will hide in religion some will hide in atheism but hide we will until god gives us a new heart it's hide and seek <laughs> oh that guy he's really seeking are you sure about that yeah he, he's on a quest for peace well yeah I, i'm sure he is But unless he's seeking the one true God, he's seeking to abandon the true God and go into all kinds of other places rather than God. But but he wants peace. And see, as a Christian, we know that the place where he'll find peace is in God, the true God, and in his son, Jesus Christ. And we assume they must want the true God in Jesus Christ because they want peace. And we know that they'll only find peace in God. But what they want is peace independent of God. They want the benefits of God without God. And oftentimes that's the way people approach people with the so-called gospel. Do you feel the weight of sin? Yeah, I'd like to have a a, a free conscience. Uh, I'd like to go to heaven. Well, I'd prefer that rather than hell. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to go to a place where I don't have any more bills. I, I like that idea. Sure. Well, we think they want God. No, no, we haven't told them about God yet. We've just told them about the benefits of what will be ours because we know God and we think they want God. And that's why true conversion, ladies and gentlemen, is a miracle. That the heart now wants God. That the heart now seeks God. And guess what? That search for God begins... When God removes the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh that beats to know Christ. Well, I'm seeking God. If that's true, I'm not doubting it. If that is true, or since that is true, God has given you a new heart. Because by nature, you don't want Him. R.C. Sproul once said this, Loving a holy God is beyond our moral power. The only kind of God we can love by our sinful nature is an unholy God, an idol made by our own hands. Unless we're born of the Spirit of God, unless God sheds His holy love in our hearts, unless He stoops in His grace to change our hearts, we will not love Him. To love a holy God requires grace. Grace strong enough to pierce our hardened hearts and awaken our moribund souls. We need a heart transplant. And people with stony hearts, which is what the Bible calls this condition, don't sign up for the transplant. We don't want to get on the list. We don't want it because we like the stony heart. We like entertainment that is not of God. We like anything that doesn't have God in it. Oh, you hear that? They're bringing religion into Christmas now. Whatever. Next. (laughs) We don't seek God, but we're commanded to. But our seeking begins when God converts the soul. But there is a seeker. That's why it's ridiculous to design worship service, a worship service for seekers, because they don't exist. (laughs) There is no God seeker. Well, I know someone who's sick. No, no, no. I'd I'd like you to go to the Bible. Does Romans 3.11 say what it says? Yeah, but he's he's just... He's just... uh, It's hyperbole. Oh, that's a great good word. He's just using hyperbole. Yeah, not, not many people are seeking. That's what he's trying to say. No. If you read the next verse, he says, as if he's anticipating, people are going to say, oh, you're just being poetic. You're using language that's an overstatement. No, he says, there is none who seeks for God. No, not one. (laughs) So that's the hyperbole argument done and dusted. Thank you. A man seeking after God begins at regeneration when he's had a heart transplant, when his heart of stone's removed, and in its place is a heart of flesh. We hide, but here's the good news. God seeks. Hallelujah. 
Verse 23, the Father is seeking those. Ah, so there is a seeker. So, in a sense, this is a seeker-sensitive service. (laughs) It is, because we're designing the service for those who seek God. And God is seeking those who worship Him. And now we've got two seekers together. God is seeking true worship and we're wanting true worship because we've got new hearts. Design the service for God and for the people of God. That's always the way it's been. In the Old Testament, God never said to Moses, go around the tents of the Amalekites, take a poll, find out what kind of service they will come to. Ask them how long the service should be, how long the preaching should be, how many songs, what type of music. Rock, reggae, rap, you ask them. Get the poll. Find out that in that area within an eight mile radius, the most popular music is that, 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 that. Put that in your service and tell people we'll have great childcare and they'll come. <laughs> nope, never happened. What God did was design the tabernacle according to his specifications. And by the way, he said, if you get it wrong, you're dead. I'm not sure I like that. God says, uh, oh, well, uh, oh, I I am so sorry. Uh, No, he didn't. He didn't say, no, I'm so sorry. It's his way or the highway. (sighs) Well, in the New Testament, it's not like that. Uh, Really, you ask Ananias and Sapphira. I believe we should have more of the power of God. We should see people slain in the Spirit. The only time I see people slain in the Spirit was... Ananias and Sapphira. (laughs) I'm not sure I want that in the service. (laughs) All they did was lie about what they put in the offering. You better check your offering envelope. (laughs) God's just the same in the New Testament. We are to be holy and worship is to be holy. Look at verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Here we have something that fills the reams of theological books over and over to speak of God in His essential nature as spiritual rather than physical. We could camp out on that phrase, God is spirit, and it would not be wasted time at all. God is spirit. He's not physical in his essence. He's spiritual. And worship should be spiritual rather than physical. Rather than the formality of doing certain things. Worship should come from the heart towards God based on his truth. In spirit and in truth. Those who worship him, see the next word, must worship in spirit and truth. True worship must have certain components to it. Two in all, spirit in spirit and truth. I've been reading and recently came across this very succinct, very precise, very concise definition of what these words mean. And I thought that's the most helpful thing I've read. I wrote it down. I want to say it to you today. In spirit and truth means a purity of devotion and a purity of doctrine. Both together. There's no divorce between the two. Purity of devotion. Zeal's good. Righteous, holy zeal. Excellent. And purity of doctrine. Now, you and I know people, if you can think of this as the two legs of the Christian walk, purity of doctrine, purity of devotion, there are some who just hop along the road. They've only got one of these legs functioning. That left leg, purity of doctrine. They got it down. They know Calvin's Institutes and Jonathan Edwards' uh, sermons. and They're they're an eight-point Spurgeonist. They also believe in the burning of heretics. I mean, they've got it down. They know truth. And yet, they're as cold as ice. The preacher has a couple of degrees after his name and that's usually the temperature of the church. It's not a good thing. Others are zealous with energy and passion and meetings after meetings. Aren't you glad we don't have too many meetings? 
I know of uh, churches in the area, they demand that you be at at least five a week. <laughs> that's, that's tough. That's tough. But some just hop around the, the road. Devotion without knowledge, that's not good. And knowledge without devotion, that's not good. God wants both spirit and truth. What is the area that you need to work on? Is it devotion? For many in our circles, that is the case. We, we know a lot. But ask about our prayer life. and uh, Ask about our witnessing to others. Uh, but there's others who've got zeal. They'll pray all night. They just don't know what they're praying for or how to pray or what to do. Or, but they're doing a lot of it. <laughs> Passionate pr- pursuit of true knowledge of God and a devoted life in harmony. That's what God intends. And that's what God is seeking. To know God to make Him known. Again, to quote Sproul, the very heart of worship, as the Bible makes clear, is this business of expressing from the depths of our spirit the highest possible honor we can offer before God. I like that. That's what worship is. There there should not be anyone who's more zealous than someone who truly knows God. Jesus was filled with zeal and He knew God more than anyone. You know that. And he said, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And he said that as he made the whips in the temple and drove out those who were the money changers. Sproul said this. In fact, I wrote down a number of his quotes earlier this morning. The Word of God can be in the mind without being in the heart, but it cannot be in the heart without first being in the mind. And What we need to do is fill our mind with true knowledge of God. You have a theology. The atheist has a theology. He's wrong in his theology, but he has one. And so the question is not, will we have theology? The question is, are you a good one or a bad one? Do you know God according to His truth? Worship is not a feeling that's expressed, but it involves also the understanding and the mind. It's not simply a feeling. It is a feeling but it's the mind filtering down into the emotions. Imagine a man who's dating a woman and he's thinking of marrying this woman but she wants her future spouse to know her and so she invites him to meet the family and to see where she grew up and maybe see where the high school was, where she went to high school and just know certain things. He says, no, I'm not interested. I love you. And she can't put the two together. I want you to meet my mom and meet my dad. I'm not interested. I just want to know you. And there's a disconnect, isn't there? Because in knowing her, you want to know everything about her. You want to know where she grew up. You want to understand why she speaks the way she does. Why she has that strange accent. (laughs) Why she's talking about putting on her pants and you had no idea it had four syllables. (laughs) We have that conversation. I must go see Pam. Pam? Who's Pam? Welcome to Pam Am flight. No, no, I I, I can't do it. It's, It's... Now when Linda talks, she'll tell you my issues and they are longer than hers, let me tell you. (laughs) I preached at Apologia Church recently and one of the elder's uh, daughters, who's not that old, said, there's that guy who can't speak English. (laughs) He's here again, Daddy. The foundation of worship in the heart is not emotional. In other words, I feel full of worship or the atmosphere is so worshipful. Sinclair Ferguson said this, actually it's theological. Worship is not something we work up, but it's something that comes down to us from the character of God. That's actually profound. When we understand who God is, what should emanate from the soul is worship. He's more majestic than I realized. It's not because the music was good that, that particular day and it just brought us into something. Here we have the idea in that that to get people to worship, you create an atmosphere. 
And if the right atmosphere isn't working, do more to get the right atmosphere in. Get, get an, a smoke machine in. Let, let them uh, see, see the, the, the praise and worship leaders through the, the, the smog and the smoke and it'll become more mysterious and they'll just have this feeling that will cause them to worship. That's not the way the Bible says worship works. Worship works when we see God when we understand who God is. And it might be simply that you read the book of Isaiah and see Him in chapter 6 and what fills your heart is an awe of God that says He is worthy whether I worship Him or not. And that there are angels around the throne that 24 hours a day, day after day, year after year are so zealous for what they see, so impacted by what they see that all they can do is cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. They're seeing something we with earthly eyes cannot see. And so our prayer is, Lord, open up our eyes, though we may not have an experience. Open up our understanding so we see who it is our God is, so that worship might flow out of our heart. And so we fill our mind with the truth about who God is, and out from that comes worship. Can't help it. I can't help it. With what I know about God, Worship has to arise in my soul. I can't be comprehending what I've studied about God and be apathetic. There's a disconnect. There's something that's not happening. It, it should result in worship. An abandonment to God. Oh God, my life is nothing unless it's lived for you. My life has meaninglessness unless it's about you. Unless I'm doing it for your glory, it's worthless. Whether I'm painting, whether I'm riding, whether I'm driving a bus, whatever I do, it should be for the glory of God. Because that's the God who demands that because of who He is. And my understanding being enlightened to who He is, worship flows out. That's how you get worshippers. Not by creating the right atmosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the great curse on the American church in our day. That we think we've got to do something rather than reveal something. No. Preacher, you get up and you tell them who God is. Preacher, you tell them this is what the Word... Very sadly, the last few minutes of this sermon was not recorded due to a technical problem we had. And so I'm sitting down and wanting to outline the content of the rest of this message so that it is not lost. I was talking about the fact that worship rises from our knowledge of the character of God. And we need to study God's Word to find out what He has revealed. And that means worship starts by means of the Word of God in the mind. Mindless Christianity, R.C. Sproul said, is no Christianity at all. You can't love what you don't know. And in many senses, we're all theologians. A Christian is to be a theologian. The word theology simply means the study of God. And everyone is a theologian in that sense. We're either good ones or bad ones. And so we need to have a quest and a desire to know God as he's revealed himself. And that means to know right doctrine. It's interesting in the book of Acts chapter 2. It says those who were receiving the word of God were baptized 3,000 souls were added. Verse 42 says this, They, that's the disciples, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I believe it's very important to realize the first mention of the things that were attended to was the apostles' teaching, doctrine, what was said, what was taught by the apostles. We now know those teachings as the New Testament. And to understand God, we need to have some things in place. And one of those primary doctrines about God is the Trinity. I love the book by Dr. James White, The Forgotten Trinity. And it starts with these four words, I love the Trinity. I remember reading that and it was a shock to my system because I'd never heard that doctrine expressed in that way. How can you love the Trinity? Well, the reason we love the Trinity is because God has revealed himself as the Trinity. 
But how many Christians have a very practical understanding of what that doctrine is and in their lives? Do they see a difference in knowing that doctrine? The fact that the Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. These are the three members of the one Godhead, as we say. Christ is God. If he's not, to worship him would be to engage in absolute idolatry. If he was only a creature, he deserved a ghastly death because he claimed to be God over and over again. He wasn't killed because he told people to love each other, but because precisely he claimed to be God. Many times we use illustrations for the Trinity, and most of the time I think they're less than useful. Sunday school illustrations, perhaps you've heard of these. Water. I remember hearing a teacher say that the Trinity is like water. And why is that? Because it has three forms, liquid, steam, and ice. Well, actually, that's heresy, because if you think about it, none of those three forms are personalities. It's not really a helpful illustration. The sun, I've heard this one. The sun in the sky, that's uh, one of the forms. And then certainly then there is the, the rays of the sun and then the warmth that we feel. So the sun in the sky, the rays that we see, and then the warmth that we feel. But the rays and the warmth, uh, they're not the sun. It's a very limited illustration. Actually, again, I think it's right to say it's heretical. Uh, What about this one? An egg. Uh, There's one egg, three parts of an egg, the shell, the egg white, the egg yolk. No, that doesn't help either. Because again, There are not three personalities. There's nothing in creation like the Trinity. There's no parallel. Uh, That's the problem. And I think, uh, as one man said, in these illustrations, children lose more than they gain when they're presented with these kind of illustrations. Uh, One thing that is kind of helpful is the idea of family. I don't think it's a perfect illustration. I'm not sure there is one. But that idea is one family and three members. We're all part of the, uh, perhaps the Samson family, and there's a husband, and he's the father, and then there's uh, the wife, and then there, uh, who's a mother, and uh, then there's a child. I understand uh, it, it goes a little further than the illustrations we've used so far, But again, it's not perfect. I think the best one I've ever come across is one I heard by J.I. Packer. Uh, When he spoke of the Trinity as a team, a three-person team, if we can imagine a soccer team of 11, same with hockey and however many are involved in a football game. Let's imagine a three-person team. How do you define a team? Well, each players related to the others in a way which remains the same whatever is going on in the game the goalkeeper the goalie he acts as a goalkeeper throughout the game no matter where the ball happens to be same with a defender same with someone who's playing offense wherever the ball goes up and down in the field the three players fulfill their distinct roles as a team so there's one team three players. I think, again, it's not perfect, but it's probably the best I've heard regarding uh, explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, One man said it this way, there's one what and three who's. And again, I think that's helpful. We're not saying that there's three what's and one what, that would be a contradiction, or one uh, person and three persons. No, we're saying one God and three persons. And that, I believe, is very clearly taught in Scripture. Now, at this point in the sermon, I gave a handout to the people in the congregation regarding the Trinity and uh, the many Scriptures that speak of it, the three uh, basic affirmations of the Trinity is the fact that although the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, The concept certainly is. In fact, the word Bible is not found in the Bible. 
but the concept of the Bible, the Word of God certainly is. Same with the doctrine of the Trinity. And so that is available. It's a handout that I gave, and uh, hopefully it'll be of use to, to, to the people and to you that are listening. Uh, let me just wrap up with the fact that we need to know who God is as he has revealed himself. He has revealed himself as one God. There are three persons in the Godhead, each of whom are described and spoken of as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each being eternal, each having equal authority and power, each having all of the attributes of divinity. And yet they are distinct. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. They are distinct. We see this in the baptism of Jesus. Jesus in the water. He's the Son, the Father speaking from heaven, and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon the Son there as he came up out of the water. So it is with the baptismal formula of Matthew 28, where we are told to go into all the world because Jesus has all authority. That's the basis on which we go. We go because Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and we are to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One name, and yet three persons mentioned. I'm going to wrap it up here. Let's remember the wonderful gospel of the triune God. The Father sent the Son into the world who died the atoning death necessary to uh, placate uh, the wrath of God due to us. And all those who believe in the Lord Jesus are freed from the wrath of God because the Christ, the Son of God, took uh, the place of sinners at the cross. The Holy Spirit applies that redemption that was bought and paid for by the Son to those whom the Father gives to the Son. There's a a unity of mission in the Trinity, and salvation is a Trinitarian work. And with that, we close this sermon. Trust it's been a blessing to you. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for all that is ours in Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'll take us on in holiness that we would please you in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.